July 4, 1776, was the historic day on which the representatives of three millions of people vocalized, conquered in Lexington and Bunker Hill, which gave notice to the world that they proposed to establish an independent nation on the theory that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The wonder and glory of the American people is not the ringing declaration of that day, but the action then already begun and in the process of being carried out in spite of every obstacle that war could be opposed, making the theory of freedom and equality a reality. We revere that day because it marks the beginnings of independence, the beginnings of a constitution that was finally to give universal freedom and equality to all American citizens, the beginnings of a government that was to recognize beyond all others the power and worth and dignity of man. Zaya began the first of government to acknowledge that it was founded on the sovereignty of the people. Zaya, the world, first beheld the revelation of modern democracy. Democracy is not a tearing down, it is a building up. It is not denial of the divine right of kings. It supplements that claim with the assertion of the divine right of all men. It does not destroy, it fulfills. It is the consummation of all theories of government, the spirit of which all the nations of the earth... Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming today. Um, my name is Rashad Thomas, and I'm the program and editorial associate here at the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation. And um, today, my talk for President's Day is going to be about um, President Calvin Coolidge's civil rights record. Um, this history is, like many things related to Calvin Coolidge, very much not well known. And at the Coolidge Foundation, it's our job, our mandate, and our joy to educate the American people about President Calvin Coolidge, our nation's 30th president. Um, and we've come to find that the more people know about Coolidge, the more they love him. So I'm glad you're here today to um, share in our, our mandate and, and give me an outlet to gab about my love for our nation's 30th president. Um, right ab around New Year's in 2016, I read an article in uh, one of those big major magazines, the New York, New York Times Magazine or The New Yorker or one of those. Um, and it was all about how um, President Calvin Coolidge was a horrible racist who um, did nothing to advance the position of minorities in the United States. And the article focused particularly on the 1924 Johnson-Reed Immigration Act that Calvin Coolidge signed into law, uh, which I personally would not have signed. Um, and people can have different opinions about how they feel about immigration, but I thought it was extremely unfair to, to call Calvin Coolidge a racist. Um, and someone who, who did that obviously had never read Calvin Coolidge's record, um, and I think unfortunately the, the sort of cloud of ignorance that exists about President Coolidge's presidency in particular can lend opportunities for people to to say things like that. Um, and my aim today is to examine President Coolidge's character and record in light of um, the facts. I'm not gonna argue that Calvin Coolidge was a proto Martin Luther King. You know, he definitely was not. But um, the record is not as, as dark and sad as that article that I read um, might have made one think. He was very much a man of his era um, shaped by the same influences and mores as other Yankee Republicans of that time. Yet, as you will soon see, the record of President Coolidge's approach to race and civil rights is undoubtedly something all students and admirers of Calvin Coolidge can be proud of. Let's begin with an overview of the racial and ideological situation in the 1920s. Now, race relations and civil rights in the 20s were nothing if not fraught and challenging. The country was firmly in the grip of the Jim Crow system of separate but equal segregation. Blacks and whites were forced by law in the South and by custom in the North to live in segregated neighborhoods, worship 
in segregated churches, attend segregated schools, and even drink from segregated water fountains. The country also experienced a number of very serious um, race riots in the early part of the 1920s. For two days in the spring of 1921, a white mob rampaged through the Greenwood community in Tulsa, Oklahoma. At the time, um, Greenwood was the wealthiest black community in the country. Hundreds of people were injured and around 300 died in what historians considered the worst racial riot in American history. The massacre of uh, the Rosewood community in Florida, actually not far from where I, I grew up, um, memorialized beautifully in the 1997 John Singleton film, um, also took place in the 1920s, in January of 1923. I encourage you to see that, watch that movie. They mentioned Warren Harding a couple times in, in that Rosewood movie. Um, at the forefront of a lot of this racial violence was the second wave of the Ku Klux Klan. The Klan was founded in the aftermath of the Civil War to resist the Reconstruction agenda um, that brought a great deal of functional equality to blacks in the states of the former Confederacy, including tremendous political influence. For instance, um, the South Carolina legislature at one point right after the Civil War during Reconstruction was majority black, if you can believe it. Um, the campaign of, of terrorism that existed in the, in the period right after the Civil War um, from the 1860s to the 1890s led to the overturning of this newfound equality. Um, so I said that the, the African Americans had a majority of seats in the South Carolina legislature in the early 1870s. Well, by the 1890s, less than 1% of South Carolina African Americans even had access to the franchise due to um, voter suppression measures such as poll taxes and literacy tests. In the wake of its success, the KKK mostly fizzled out by the turn of the 20th century. All of mainstream public opinion was on its side, so the organization lost its, its luster and membership dwindled. However, as um, a good friend of the Coolidge Foundation and a Coolidge historian, Jerry Wallace notes in his article, The Ku Klux Klan in Calvin Coolidge's America, the memory of the Klan did not die off in the early 20s, or in the early um, 1900s. Instead, it was romanticized, with the Klansmen being lionized as the savior of white Southern civilization, and this was perpetuated in Thomas Dixon's best-selling trilogy, um, The Leopard Spots in 1902, The Klansmen in 1905, and The Traitor in 1907. The Klansmen was adapted into a stage play soon after its publication, and later, in 1915, into a famous motion picture, um, which was called The Birth of a Nation by D.W. Griffiths. And this film became the first to be shown at the White House, the first moving picture ever shown at the White House. Um, it was screened by, for President Woodrow Wilson in 1915, in February of 1915. The president reportedly said afterwards, the film was, quote, like writing history with lightning. And my only regret is that it is all so terribly true, unquote. Mr. Wilson has a very spotty record. <laughs> this romanticized view of the Klan, which became interwoven into the postbellum Southern culture, played a significant role in the Klan's later revival in the 1920s. This is what, what's known as the second wave. Now, the second wave Klan sought to further sanitize the organization's reputation. It billed itself simply as um, a nationalist nationalistic and patriotic fraternity um, akin to the Roman Catholic Knights of Columbus or the Elks Club or uh, the Freemasons, that sort of thing. And this was a wise move because those types of, of voluntary um, fraternal benefit societies were very popular in the 1920s and the KKK took its place along, alongside those groups. Yet despite that veneer of respectability, the sinister racism that had always characterized the Klan um, continued to govern its activities. Yet the new Klan expanded its universe of disdain to encompass not just African Americans, but other groups as well, including Roman Catholics, Jews, Southern and Eastern European immigrants, most of whom were either Catholics or Jews, um, and the like. At the heart of the Klan's um, image of America was the idealization of white Protestant America. Um, in the Klan's view, non-whites, which included Southern and Eastern European migrants, um, and non-Protestants could not assimilate and become fully like any other American. 
So they must either be kept out of the country or kept out of power um, if they're already in the country. The second wave plans high point, its apogee came in the 1920s, after which um, it experienced a very steep decline, due in no small part to President Calvin Coolidge. Um, Coolidge understood very well that prejudice was the zeitgeist of the age. Um, he understood how effective it was for politicians to pander to the lesser angels of man's nature, yet he chose instead to stand for the dignity and equality of all of his fellow Americans. From the most powerful platform in the country, Calvin Coolidge spoke eloquently in favor of the values of inclusivity. During his vice presidency, he visited Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, which is an historically black school, um, to, de to dedicate the Veterans Hospital there. The late historian Maceo Crenshaw Daly, Jr., notes that by 1923, Coolidge had come to sympathize with blacks on some problems regarding their plight in American society, and he'd also come to understand these issues through contact with Tuskegee men, such as Robert Russa Moton, Emmett J. Scott, and William H. Lewis. Like their godfather, Booker T. Washington, um, they were leaders who sought to profit the black community by ties to powerful politicians and ph philanthropists in both the North and the South. This was a huge part of um, the way African Americans tried to advance their situation in the years between the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement. These um, institutions like Tuskegee were developed um, by a great deal with philanthropy from northern uh, businessmen and wealthy folks who um, were not, I mean, they, weren't, they didn't believe in the social equality of blacks, but they certainly believed in um, gaining education to, to African Americans and did so by supporting institutions like Tuskegee and like my alma mater, Florida a &M University in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, but I, I digress. <laughs> uh, consequently, they turned to Calvin Coolidge uh, with similar thoughts when he became president in 1923. Coolidge's ties to these individuals, coupled with his willingness to meet with other distinguished reform-minded blacks, augured well for the president during um, his formative months in office and led to a period of goodwill between the president and the overall black community. Coolidge welcomed officials um, of the Negro National Education Congress to the White House in September 1923 and listened attentively to their expressions of alarm about the problems of segregation and discrimination within the federal government. Woodrow Wilson had implemented um, segregation in all of the federal government offices in the uh, middle of the 19-teens, so that was a, a, a sticking issue for the black community. In October, the president granted an interview to an African-American group um, brought to Washington by William Monroe Trotter, the fiery editor of the Boston Guardian, a black newspaper. Trotter had gained much attention at the turn of the 20th century as a major critic of Booker T. Washington's public program of placing development and trade schools education ahead of um, the struggle for civil rights and civil liberties for African-Americans, a, a long-running um, dispute during the, the pre-civil rights era within the black community. Should you focus on education and um, jobs, training, and skills, or should you focus on overturning the, the racist laws? Um, represented, Booker T. Washington represented the trade school side of it, and W.B. Du Bois represented the, you know, confront um, the racist laws side of the argument. Um, in that meeting, Trotter urged the president to continue to assist Moton, the head of Tuskegee Institute, in his efforts to ensure blacks a central role in policies pertaining to the Veterans Hospital at Tuskegee. Um, Trotter also encouraged Coolidge to give strong backing to an anti-lynching law, or an anti-lynching bill, didn't become law, unfortunately. It was expected to come before Congress in 1924 and take steps to increase the enrollment of blacks at West Point and the Naval Academy. After the Trotter meeting, the president met another black delegation led to the White House in the same month by the prominent African-American attorney from Richmond, Virginia, Giles B. Jackson, who impressed upon Coolidge the need for the, a Negro Industrial Commission, um, a proposal expected to be included in um, a bill offered by a Delaware congressman to be considered by the House of Representatives later in 1924. And now Coolidge was drawn politically to the Tuskegee-oriented faction as a whole, 
Um, but it appeared for a moment in 1923, in October of that year, that his doors were open to other significant black leaders who were, who were agitating for more um, political participation by African Americans um, in the press, in civil rights organizations, educational institutions, and within Coolidge's own Republican Party as well. Thus, despite initial reservations, blacks as a whole were more optimistic as the new administration began to take shape. An indication of their positive attitude toward the president was reflected in the DC black newspaper, The Washington Eagle, which opined that, quote, much significance is attached to the easy access to the White House, which colored citizens now enjoy, unquote. Coolidge did remain open to visits and discussions with African Americans and sought their advice on matters of race relations. Any, any doubts he may have had about what African Americans wanted politically uh, must have been dispelled by these meetings. In particular, he received a long detailed memorandum in November of 1923 um, from the head of the Associated Negro, Negro Press, Nahum B. Brasher, who placed his news service at the disposal of the president um, as he had done so for President Warren Harding. Brasher wrote to Coolidge summarizing and confirming that the issues central to African Americans were policy changes to stop lynchings, um, segregation in public offices, and the discriminatory policies of the civil service. Brasher also advised the president to provide more patronage appointments um, for blacks, extend the influences of African Americans in policy making decisions at um, the Veterans Hospital at Tuskegee, ensure the enfranchisement of more blacks in the southern states, and increase the number of black representatives at uh, Republican national conventions. Resolving all of these problems to the satisfaction of African Americans was definitely going to be a difficult assignment for President Coolidge, but he continued to give hope to blacks that some reform was forthcoming by his willingness to, to discuss these matters publicly, which he did not shy away from doing in the least. At the dawn of his presidency, in his first major address to the American people and to Congress, um, President Coolidge took the opportunity to, to um, speak to some of these concerns um, that the meetings brought to the fore. In his first State of the Union message on December 6th, 1923, um, he drew attention to the plight of African Americans and to propose major legislative initiatives to improve their situation. And here's a quote from the President's um, first State of the Union message and the only one he delivered in person before the uh, joint session of the United States Congress. And I quote, numbered among our population are some 12 million colored people. Under our Constitution, their rights are just as sacred as those of any other citizen. It is both a public and a private duty to protect those rights. The Congress ought to exercise all its powers of prevention and punishment against the hideous crime of lynching, of which the Negroes are by no means the sole sufferers, but for which they furnish a majority of the victims. Already a considerable sum is appropriated to give the Negroes vocational training in agriculture. About half a million dollars is recommended for medical courses at Howard University to help contribute to the education of 500 colored doctors needed each year. On account of the integration of large numbers into industrial centers, it has been proposed that a commission be created composed of members from both races to formulate a better policy for mutual understanding and confidence. Such an effort is to be commended. Everyone would rejoice in the accomplishments of the results which it seeks, but it is well to recognize that these difficulties are to a large extent local problems which much must be worked out by the mutual forbearance and human kindness of each community. Such a method gives much more promise of a real remedy than outside interference. I, can, I think we can all agree that those last few lines were a tad um, ingenuous, <laughs> but the overall spirit of President Coolidge's words could not have been more positive and respectful. In these succinct but significant statements, the President touched upon issues that had long troubled blacks and for which they had sought solutions on many previous occasions. Lynchings had been a perennial problem since the American Civil War. From 1880 to 1920, some 3,112 African Americans had been victims of lynch mobs in the United States. But congressional legislative measures to end this often racially motivated crime had been voted down on five separate occasions prior to 1923. In 1923, um, the year in which Congressman Dyer's anti-lynching measure was defeated in the United States Senate, a total of 29 African Americans had been hanged uh, by mobs. 
Anticipating the reintroduction of the Dyer Bill in Congress in 1924, Coolidge took a courageous step in urging Capitol Hill legislators to pass the anti-lynching measure. Often these anti-lynching bills would have been passed by the House of Representatives, but then defeated on, on filibuster in the US Senate, and there was no 60 vote threshold then. You had to have unanimous consent to cut off a filibuster. It's amazing they got anything done back then. <laughs> The chief exec executive's recommendation for a biracial commission for easing the settlement of southern black migrants in the north um, amounted to an endorsement of the Layton Bill, the bill from that Delaware congressman, um, one of the goals of which was to facilitate the transition of workers to life in um, urban regions. This particular bill was scheduled to come before Congress in 1924. Coolidge's pledging of funds for Howard University, an institution experiencing the kind of growth and development in the 1920s, um, which encouraged African Americans to label it the capstone of Negro education, proved extremely soothing to many African Americans who looked to the Washington DC Center of Learning um, for the much needed cadre of well-trained professionals, doctors, dentists, lawyers, engineers, preachers, and teachers vital to the welfare of the black community. In all, the African American segment of President Coolidge's annual speech before Congress in 1923 was favorably received by blacks who interpreted it as the beginning of um, a new presidential sensitivity to their efforts to improve the lives of African American citizens. The president never ceased to set the same tone in his words and actions throughout his presidency. It was in this spirit that speaking at the dedication of the John Erickson statue on May 29, 1926, the president stated his belief that, uh, and I quote, when once our feet have touched this soil, when once we have made this land our home, wherever our place of birth, whatever our race, we are all blended in one common country. All artificial distinctions of lineage and rank are cast aside. We all rejoice in the title of Americans, unquote. He would be called upon at several points to address directly the challenge to the American ideal the Klan presented. In August 1924, Harlem Republicans nominated a black dentist and former city alderman, Dr. Charles H. Roberts, for Congress in New York's 21st Congressional District. Not everyone approved. Among the critics was an army sergeant called Charles F. Gardner, who was stationed um, at Fort Hamilton in Brooklyn. Gardner wrote President Coolidge directly in protest at the nomination. President Coolidge responded to Sergeant Gardner on August 9th. Tuesday, two days later, he released his response to the press. Now, mind you, this is three months before his election, his official election to the presidency. So he's in the middle of a presidential campaign. And um, he released this, this letter that didn't mince words <laughs> to, to the press. The black newspaper, the Brooklyn Daily, Daily Times, wrote, Quote, the president has made the clearest, quietest, and most convincing statement on this subject let, yet made. President Coolidge's letter read in part, and I quote, I was amazed to receive such a letter. During the war, 500,000 colored men and boys were called upon under the draft, not one of whom sought to evade it. They took their places wherever assigned in defense of the nation of which they are just as truly citizens as are any others. The suggestion of denying any measure of their full political rights to such a great group of our population as the colored people is one which, however it might be received in some other quarters, could not possibly be permitted by one who feels a responsibility for living up to the traditions and maintaining the principles of the Republican Party. Our Constitution guarantees equal rights to all our citizens without discrimination on account of race or color. I have taken my oath to support that Constitution. It is the source of your rights and my rights. I, proposed, I purpose to regard it and administer it as the source of the rights of all the people, whatever their belief or race. A colored man is precisely as much entitled to submit his candidacy to a party <coughs> primary as is any other citizen. The decision must be made by the constituents to whom he offers himself and by nobody else. You have suggested that in some fashion I should bring influence to bear to prevent the possibility of a colored man being nominated for Congress. In reply, I quote my great predecessor, Theodore Roosevelt. I cannot consent to take the position that the door of hope, the door of opportunity, is to be shut upon any man, no matter how worthy, 
purely upon the grounds of race or color. Unquote. Yours, yours very truly, Calvin Coolidge. And as the newspaper clippings that we have on the back show, this candidate ended up losing the general election, unfortunately. But it wasn't for lack of endorsement from President Coolidge. Um, this letter, as I said, was released shortly before the 1924 presidential election. Coolidge was quite willing to take political risks when it came to standing up for racial equality. He'd made an even more public gesture just a few months before this letter was released when he agreed to give the commencement address at Howard University. Howard is, of course, um, a historically black university in the heart of Washington, D.C. Uh, that was founded by um, Congregationalists in 1867. Taking the podium at the open air commencement that June day in 1924, President Coolidge looked out at the Howard graduates and said the following. The nation has need of all that can be contributed to it through the best efforts of all its citizens. The colored people have repeatedly proved their devotion to the high ideals of our country. They gave their services to the war with the same patriotism and readiness that other citizens did. The propaganda of prejudice and hatred which sought to keep the colored men from supporting the national cause completely failed. The black man showed himself the same kind of citizen, moved by the same kind of patriotism as the white man. They were tempted, but not one betrayed his country. They came home with many decorations, and their conduct repeatedly won high commendation from both Americans and European commanders. The words Coolidge spoke in this speech were astonishing. African Americans who had fought in the First World War came home from that conflict to a society woefully enthralled to state-sanctioned segregation. Many of America's black veterans received honors from the French government, but their sacrifices and contributions to their homeland were met with disregard when they sought a remedy to their plight here at home. In his Howard speech, Coolidge acknowledged the patriotism of African Americans, even in the face of contrary voices who tried to persuade them that they shouldn't fight for the United States. African Americans had not failed their country, but their, their country certainly had failed them. As Coolidge's speech continued, he praised Howard and the leadership role its graduates played in America. He ended by returning to the theme of the national crisis which the United States was bound to encounter in the future. And I quote, we cannot go out from this place and occasion without refreshment of faith and renewal of conscience that in every exigency, our Negro citizens will render the best and fullest, fullest measure of service, wherefore they are capable, unquote. The tone President Coolidge set cannot be underestimated. At the beginning of his presidency, lynchings were occurring with alarming frequency. By the end of his presidency, they had dropped significantly, as had membership of the Ku Klux Klan. Famous African-American civil rights icon and educator, W.B. Du Bois, remarked that in the 1924 presidential election, Coolidge received a million votes in the black community. On his final day in office, March 4, 1929, President Coolidge signed Public Resolution 107, which initiated a commission to design and construct a national monument to the Negro, which would stand as, quote, a tribute to the Negro's contributions to the achievements of America, unquote. Unfortunately, the legislation was signed without any funding attached. And with the onset of the Great Depression during Herbert Hoover's presidency, impetus for the project eventually fizzled out. The idea that began with Coolidge's signing of, of Public Resolution 107 um, culminated just last year with the inauguration of the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture, which stands in the shadow of the Washington Monument in our nation's capital to this day. It is, of course, difficult to argue that President Coolidge's actions were definitive in marking the shift towards greater equality among the races that would take place later on in the 20th century. Yet, as we can see, he played a symbolic role in laying the groundwork for a better future. The picture is obviously complicated. It is difficult to argue that any man should have to wait for another man's consent to be free to exercise his full rights as a citizen of this country. Um, yet the pre-civil rights movement days dictated just that. To his credit, President Coolidge made gestures signaling the importance of equality under the law and worked in a number of ways, both big and small, to bring those views to prominence. There is an image 
that exists from the 1920 campaign that shows President um, Abraham Lincoln, the founder of the Republican Party, standing over Warren Harding, the, the presidential nominee, and Calvin Coolidge, the vice presidential nominee, with his hands over their heads in blessing. <laughs> and it's one of my favorite images of Calvin Coolidge, um, sort of showing Abraham Lincoln, the founder of the Republican par Party, who freed the enslaved people uh, um, in the Civil War, in the aftermath of the Civil War, handing the baton on to uh, the new generation with Calvin Coolidge and Warren Harding, and always working towards um, a better future. So I think that President Coolidge very much lived up to that legacy in the way he conducted himself in, in public office. And it is with the benefit of hindsight that we can see that Coolidge did as much as he could, given the political situation of his age, to advance um, equality. And for that, he is to be commended. Thank you very much. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Times Magazine or the New, York, New Yorker. When you find out where that came from and when it was published, I hope that you will make this speech uh, in, in writing uh, a rebuttal to that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, I tried to rack my brain to recall where I'd seen it, um, but I just couldn't remember. I even Googled around for it, but I couldn't, I couldn't remember where I, I found it. But I, I thought it was very... Um, very unfortunate to, to, to read that article, because as you can see, the record it couldn't be further from the truth. Yes, sir. Was there public criticism of Coolidge for, for taking these stands? Well, um, there, there certainly was from um, people who were OK with the KKK. <laughs> you know, the KKK had a very large membership, and um, they, they didn't like um, any politician who spoke up about the equality of African Americans. And of course, President Coolidge didn't win any southern states in his election campaign in 1924. Um, it was, he won all of the, he won pretty much everywhere but the 12 states of the former Confederacy and Wisconsin because there was a third party candidate. But yeah, he definitely did receive pushback um, from, from folks who, mostly in the South, who were supportive of the, the segregation regime. That was the, the mainstream opinion of the time, you know. Um, and, and I think when you look at what, what President Coolidge did, he was very much a, a believer in federalism. So, um, and and that, was, that was a part of the Republican Party and the Democratic Party at the time, a, a really firm belief in the division of powers between the national government and the state governments. And segregation was a, a state government issue. And um, most politicians, whether they were Democrat or Republican, were loath to involve the federal government in um, directly attacking that issue. It wouldn't it be until after the, um, the civil rights movement or the beginning of the civil rights movement that there was a reawakening of an understanding that, you know, enforcing civil rights is a federal responsibility because it's written into our, our constitution in the particularly in the 14th Amendment, equal protection under the law, um, and all that good stuff. So it was a, it was a different approach, sadly, and, and not as effective as those of us who live today would, would hope it, it would have been. But for its age, it was definitely very revolutionary. Yes, sir. So, who was um, by the states, Vermont stance, It's possible. I'm not sure he ever, I, I've never encountered any concrete evidence that he um, drew any sort of inspiration from Vermont's uh, specific example when it comes to civil rights. But you, you've got to think, you know, growing up in this place, that that legacy would have been a part of his, um, his upbringing and his, his 
his educational experiences, his formative experiences. You know, Vermont, Vermont was the first state to abolish slavery in, in the country's history, but it was when Calvin Coolidge was growing up and to this very day, a very white state. <laughs> um, so President Coolidge didn't even encounter any African Americans in his life until he went to college. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's difficult to, I mean, you know, I'm sure even, even in the late 1800s, people in Vermont would have had certain prejudices about African Americans and whatnot, because that was just the way things were. Um, there was a, but it was a, it was a lot different than the situation in the South. In the South, because African Americans were there, I mean, you know, the, the vast majority of blacks lived in the South and still do um, to this very day. Um, the, the impetus for indoctrinating people in racism was a lot more immediate in the South than it was in Vermont. So that may have been a part of, of um, President Coolidge's mental and, and, and intellectual development, but I've never run into any evidence about like anything concrete, but it's, it's a good theory. Yes, sir. You quoted Calvin Coolidge as saying several things. That doesn't fit in with Calvin Coolidge's silent cow <laughs> reputation, which was <coughs> best exemplified by a woman who was sitting beside him and was, who was met by her friends and said she couldn't get Calvin to say more than two words. You lose. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> this Give is me your impression on Calvin as a silent cow. This is one of my favorite Coolidge misconceptions to debunk. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's true that President Coolidge, in personal conversation, um, used an economy of words. He was very laconic. He did not. He did not enjoy small talk. He thought that um, when you had something to say, you should say it and be done with it. And he, he just didn't have time for small talk, basically. But when it came to being a politician, and be, you know, politicians have to give speeches, they have to communicate their ideas to uh, the people, Coolidge was not shy about doing that. In fact, he wrote his own speeches. He's the last president to write all of his own speeches. And um, his speeches were incredibly eloquent in many respects. He, he was a, a classically trained person. He got his education at Amherst College in the late 1890s, and he learned from some of the best. So, and he won several, he won a speech competition, um, um, or, or no, I'm sorry, an essay comp, that was an essay, the Grove, not the Grove, well he was, I'm thinking of two things. I'm thinking of the Grove Oration, which he gave um, at the commencement at Amherst in 1895, which is a speech that his, his um, classmates selected him to give. And I'm also thinking of an award he got for writing um, about the principles fought for in the Declaration of, or in the American Revolution, to um, that he won an award for, a medal for, and when he won the, the medal, um, he didn't like, he he sent the newspaper clipping to his father or something because he didn't want to tell his dad um, like directly that he'd won this thing, but he wanted, oh look, dad, I won this thing that you see in the newspaper, whatever. <laughs> he, didn't want to, he didn't want to toot his own horn too too loudly. But yeah, so Calvin Coolidge, he definitely was silent when it came to personal, interpersonal communication. But when it came to what politicians have to do to communicate with people, he was very eloquent. He, he, um, he, he gave more press conferences than any president in American history. And those are all, we don't have recordings of them, but we do have transcripts of them. They're all on our website, uh, the Coolidge Foundation, coolidgefoundation.org. And um, he was also the first radio president. Uh, and if you've ever heard his voice, it's very, it's, it's almost like a, um, you don't hear it very often these days. It's like the old New England accent. He had a very thick New England accent. And it, it sounded very good on the radio. And he was, he was the first president that most Americans could welcome into their homes um, over the radio in American history. And he was not shy about using that new resource to connect with the American people. So, yes, yeah, Silent Cal, it's, it's definitely a true appellation, but um, only true as far as it goes. He was a politician, after all. <laughs> Any other questions? Mm -hmm. mm. Pro kind of things that were happening in the South. 
how they were debunk, debunk, debunked, I guess, they were debunked. Overturned. Who <laughs> uh, um, that is, I don't know if you know about those movies or not. But oh yes, I've seen both of them, <laughs> and particularly loving, love that movie. Um, but you, you remind me actually of um, the play Hamilton, which I, I was, had the pleasure of seeing in December, and I keep thinking, man, we should send a copy of the Coolidge biography to Lin-Manuel Miranda, and maybe he could, he could turn it into, if you're watching Mr. Miranda, <laughs> we'd, we'd be happy to send you a, a copy, and if you want to turn it into a, a Broadway play, we'd love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, folks. And um, we have copies of the Coolidge Quarterly um, from the fall, which is our quarterly publication. It has an article by the former mayor of Baltimore, Kurt Schmoke, going over a lot of the, the history that I expounded today and some other things as well, including an article I wrote about President Coolidge's church um, that he attended in D.C. while he was president of the First Congregational Church of Washington, D.C., which helped found um, Howard University and was one of the first places to have Marian Anderson, the famous opera singer, um, sing in D.C. in 1926, years before the Daughters of the American Revolution spat with Eleanor Roosevelt, um, and about Coolidge's pastor, um, Jason Noble Pierce, who was a part of all that. So if you, you're, you're welcome to take copies of that as well, and to um, Learn more about President Coolidge here at the historic site. The exhibits are open um, in this building, and the cheese factory is open, and you're welcome to walk in the village, even though the historic buildings aren't open, but you're certainly welcome to take pictures and, and whatnot of the birthplace and the homestead. So thank you very much for coming, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.